Welcome back to Sports Exercise and Health Science. Uh, this is Mr. Kabuski reporting from our lovely science office here at Cathedral High School. Uh, we're on our last section of our unit one. Uh, again, if you did this a little differently, um, then it might be in the middle of your sixth unit. Uh, but for the way uh, I work this class, this is actually the fourth section of our first unit. So we just got done talking about statistical analysis. Now we did 6.1, talking about you know t-tests and correlation tests and things like that. Getting ready to actually do our study uh, for our first independent assessment. But now we need to talk about like how to actually design a good study. So we're on to the fourth unit, which is all about study design. So a couple of terms you need to be familiar with. First one is specificity. Okay, that's the idea that whatever I want to test, like if I'm testing like let's say basketball, I want to make sure that whatever test I design uh, is specifically designed with that sport in mind. Um, a, a great example, and you can see the one I have listed here, okay, let's say I've got an endurance runner. Okay, a great endurance test is to get people on the rowing machine, okay, and, and get them to do that as long as they can, as hard as they can, or a certain level, uh, and so on, okay. So would that be a good test of endurance for a marathon runner or an endurance runner? Well, I mean, technically, yes, because you're still testing endurance, but a better test might be to do an endurance test on a treadmill and see how long they could do that in a laboratory setting. Again, it's more specific to what we're actually going to be doing. Uh, obviously, maybe they don't have as strong as arms, so that endurance test wouldn't necessarily be legitimate okay, because it's not specific enough uh, to the sport. So specificity, make sure that my test is actually testing what I want to find out. Uh, accuracy. Uh, this has more to do with the way that you're going to actually uh, ca uh, calculate your data, your, your quantitative data, uh, meaning that I want to have measurements as precise as possible, meaning as close to the actual value as possible. An accurate uh, measurement is one that uh, is going to be close to the expected outcome. So I want to use tools that give me that ability. So I'll, I'll give you a good example. Uh, if I use a, a stopwatch okay, that only goes to the tenths of a second, as opposed to using one that goes to the hundreds or even thousands of a second, I would want to use the one that's more accurate because that's going to end up showing differences or correlations at a greater rate. Uh, so it's actually going to show the difference. Okay, I'll give you a great example. We're running forties for football, let's say. Okay, so I've got a kid that runs a four six forty and a kid that runs a four nine forty. Now those are two really different styles of kids right there. Four six is pretty fast. Four nine not so much. So if I just round that, if I didn't include the tenths and I just rounded them up to five, they both look like they're the same type of athlete. So again, being as accurate as possible in my measurement, always important. Reliability. Can I repeat the same procedure, the same test, and get similar or the same results? If I can't, then that means there were errors in my original test and it was not reliable. Now, it doesn't mean your test is necessarily invalid. In fact, errors are a good thing. Because errors give us a chance to kind of explain what we think happened and why and maybe where we could go from here. But obviously, if my results come back as pretty unreliable, then I'm probably going to expect you to redo that test. We want it to be as reliable as possible. Okay? So a good study, uh, and again, this kind of goes back to like your earlier science classes, but I should have two types of groups, a control and experimental, meaning that I should know the result of one already. Uh, and then one I'm doing some type of test on. So whenever possible, I want to have a control group and an experimental group. While I'm on that topic, groups should be big. The bigger the better because that eliminates the chances for um, unpredictable things to happen, for outliers to happen. It gives me a, a greater, a better spread uh, on my bell curve. Okay? I need to be able to identify independent and dependent variables. Now, I teach this in my freshman biology classes saying the independent variable starts with an I and I control that I change those two things. Whereas a dependent variable then uh, is what I'm actually going to measure during the test. It's dependent on the test. So I control the independent, dependent is done by the test, whatever I'm measuring. Uh, I want to identify as many constants as possible when I'm creating a test. A constant is something that I'm going to keep the same from one test to another. Temperature is the same, time is the same, what they had to eat before to eat, or what their pregame routine, and all that stuff, whatever it may be, whatever it is for your test, we want to keep as much the same between our two groups or two tests as possible so that I'm really only testing that one independent variable. Uh, placebo, if I use a placebo in mind, if I'm doing something where I, uh, you know, I tell people you know, that uh, a certain drink might t make them perform at a better rate, I might want to give them a placebo too. A placebo is something um, that you're going to give the participants that they think is going to make them do something a certain way, but in reality you already know it's a controlled, it's water or it's a sugar pill or something like that. Okay, a really good example is placebos 
making you know you tell people that it's going to increase their feelings or, or of, of like pain or emotion or whatever and then uh, you know you do some type of test on them and if they think that it's going to in, in, increase that emotion or that feeling then they will actually give you those results because they think it's going to happen even though that placebo really was just a sugar pill that doesn't do anything uh, blinding and double blinding that's when you put people into the groups you don't tell them which group they're in uh, and, and so on and so forth all right Lastly, a Park U test. Okay, now I'm going to flip over. It's really a questionnaire more than a test, but it's a seven uh, question questionnaire. And basically, uh, it's for anybody from ages 15 to 69. Okay, so whenever I'm going to do a test, uh, especially one where I'm going to ask people to do something athletic, uh, I'm going to probably ask them to fill out this Park U along with the disclaimer saying that they understand that there's a chance uh, for risk and things like that anytime they do an athletic type test. Uh, but this is the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire, or Park U. It's seven questions. If they answer yes to any of them, you're not going to include them in your study because that basically tells us that there's something medically or physically wrong with them that probably should not be included because it might be more dangerous to, to them than it is beneficial to our test. Uh, so you can see the list of questions here. Again, if they answer no to all of them, you're good to start, at, start physical activity. Uh, but again, it kind of is an idea uh, of physical readiness, but more importantly, it's a good legal document to have to kind of prove like, Okay, they said yes or no to all these things. We note all these things that they told me that they were physically ready. Uh, that's kind of their disclaimer saying yes, I understand, and yes, this is where I'm at. Uh, and so it kind of protects you as well as gives you a, a better um, study group in your group. All right, and then the last couple of things. Know the difference between a lab test and a field test. Lab test is obviously done in a lab setting, controlled environment. A field test is not. It's done out in the open. It's done in the elements wherever the actual physical activity would normally take place. If it's a football player, then they're doing it on the field. If it's a basketball player, then they're doing it in a court or things like that. So is your test a lab test or a field test? Both have their adv advantages and disadvantages. Lab tests, obviously a controlled environment. Uh, sometimes it's hard to control all those things, hard to get that space, hard to actually get them to do the thing that you want to test. Whereas a field test, again, you're exposed to the elements even though you may be on the actual course. Uh, and then maximal tests versus submaximal tests. Maximal tests uh, are obviously great because you're going to get somebody's max effort. You're going to get a, a final number. You don't have to do any calculations. Problem with maximal tests is people may actually not ever reach their maximum because they're afraid of injury or because they think they physically have gone to their limit. So it's actually pretty hard to do maximal tests and it can be dangerous too. On the flip side, a submaximal test is you're going to tell them to do a certain percentage below their maximum, whether you're doing heart rates or whether you're just doing the, you know, like a number you're giving them. And then you're going to take that number and whatever percentage it matches and then estimate what their max would be. Again, disadvantage, how do you know they're actually at that number? Advantages, it's a lot safer and easier.